Today's multiverse tales story is one that I've been building to for over a year, and I'm very excited to finally be telling it. There's no new characters involved in this episode, so like when I did the story Soul of the Enemy, I'm going to be drawing some updated and alternative designs for some of the already existing characters in multiverse tales. Let's get into it, shall we? Let's go. Hit like if you want, subscribe if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. Kate Blakeur, or Unkillable Kate as she was more commonly known to her group of multiverse traversing friends, was in a strange mental state for her. As she leaned against the wall outside the cold plunge room of the Sharp Tank, she was feeling relaxed and genuinely happy. It had been about a year since she'd escaped from Baxell's prison, and while she knew she still had a lot of pent up resentment towards Dresden, the man who'd trapped her in there for 20 years, she found herself thinking about her desire to kill him less and less. Maybe it was just Sterling rubbing off on her. Sterling and Jill served as a sort of emotional support for their whole team, but had been particularly focused on helping Kate get over a lot of the issues she had after escaping. She still thought he could be a bit overly optimistic, but he was a firm believer that Dresden was on a path to apologizing and atoning for all he'd done. Sterling thought Dresden would eventually even become an ally to them all, despite the fact that there was still ample evidence to suggest Dresden was actually planning to kill all of the overseers of the multiverse. That week in particular, Sterling had also been in an even more chipper mood than usual. Most of the Sharp Gang had been spending the last couple days in the building, and he kept saying how he had a weird feeling that it was going to be an amazing week. Kate was starting to think that he may even be right. Ready for the cold, Kate? Sterling said, walking up to her as if her thoughts had summoned him. She gave a slight grin. I'm always ready. Real question is, are you finally going to hit seven minutes with your flame going? Sterling would use their time in the ice baths to push how long he could keep his internal body temperature up and continue using his fire powers. Seven? Psh, I'm hitting eight today, you watch. She chuckled at his ever-present optimism and shook her head, and seeing her smile more seemed to make him smile even bigger as well. Before they both moved into the room, she hesitated, but then gave Sterling a quick hug. She was still not particularly comfortable with physical contact with most people, but every time she willingly embraced Sterling, she felt like it was getting a bit easier, and she was even finding she enjoyed it. Though, that might have just been because it was with Sterling. As she stepped back, she saw that somehow his smile had gotten even bigger, and that his face had gone a bit red. Sterling was just about to pull off his shirt and get into the tubs as Astra walked up. As much as I'd love to see whatever's happening here, were either of you expecting anyone else to visit from another universe? I'm pretty sure most of our odd little crew is here, but I just felt someone jump into our nexus point. Before either of them could answer, the youngest members of the group, who'd also been briefly locked up in Baxell's prison with Kate, Jake and Anna, yelled down the halls, Alexis! Sterling! Keith! Anybody! They both sprinted towards Kate, and Sterling knelt down quickly and put a hand on each of their shoulders as they skidded to a halt. What is it, you two? Anna answered in a shaking voice. D -d -d Dresden's here, and he, he has two of the multiversal orb shards with him. Kate felt her fists instantly clench. But Sterling, on the other hand, leapt up and clapped his hands together with a huge, giddy grin. I knew this was going to be a great week. It's finally happening. He sprinted down the halls where Jake and Anna had just come from, and Kate followed quickly behind. They weaved through a few halls before Sterling's run turned to a fast skip then a stop, a few feet away from Dresden, Oakland, standing in their foyer indeed holding two of the four pieces of the most powerful artifact in the multiverse. Kate could feel her anger starting to bubble up again upon seeing her old captor, but let Sterling take the lead, seeing that it was possible that the chipper hero maybe hadn't been overly optimistic after all. Maybe Dresden was here to try and atone. Sterling asked in a far too eager voice, Hey, Dresden, it's nice to see you. You here for lunch or something? And in response, Dresden simply tossed the two pieces of the orb to the ground towards Sterling. They both clacked along the polished concrete floor. The rest of the group had heard the news and was running in to see what was happening. Alexis, who was essentially the team's leader, ran up next to Sterling with a cluster of stones coated over her fist, ready for a fight. Sterling ducked down, grabbed the orb shards, then tossed one back to Astra and set the other in Alexis's free hand. With a huge smile, he said, Don't worry, Alexis, I've got this. He then walked closer to their unexpected visitor. 
Dresden, I know this can't have been an easy decision for you to have made, and even though we do have a lot of stuff to deal with and discuss in terms of you know, your history with a bunch of the people in our group, I am so grateful that Mr. you have- Mr. and Jeel, please stop. Dresden muttered uncharacteristically quietly. But in his overeager state, Sterling didn't. He reached Dresden and tried to look him in the eyes. It's okay, this is all gonna take time, but this is a very forgiving group. I mean, heck, Harold has literally killed children before, and we're still helping to try and rehabilitate him. Now that you've changed your mind about killing the Overseers, we can- I have not changed my mind, Angeal. Kate couldn't see Sterling's face, but she could practically feel his smile slipping. What? But I'm- you're here, and, and that's what's important. We can help show you that there's a better way to deal with the problems that overseers cause, and eventually, hopefully- Sterling, it is already done. Sterling took a slight step back, as if Dresden's words had hit him with a shockwave. What, what do you mean? Eight hours ago, I called in the 16,444 overseer bonds I'd made over the last 6,000 years. I opened my dimension for transportation in, but not out, and requested that every overseer who owed me a debt leap into the first floor of my prison, claiming that I needed their help to stop a prison riot that was getting too far out of hand. Many of them were unaware that in my prison their own overseer abilities would not work. Of the 16,444, only 127 refused the call. The rest were trapped inside. Sterling stumbled back and grabbed the multiversal orb shard back out of Alexis's hands. Okay, well, well, that's obviously not good, but it's also not that big of a deal. You're obviously here because you felt bad, and now we can let all the overseers back out and stop any more of them from getting hurt by the people in back cells, or even just move them to a different part of back cells where they'll be safe while we figure out what we should actually- He rambled on, and Dresden continued to try and stop Sterling as he used the orb shard to open a portal to the prison world, but Dresden's protests were ignored. A portal was open to back cells, but it wasn't there, not as it had been before. The orb shard fell from Sterling's hands. The whole group stared through the portal to see, for miles and miles, nothing but debris floating through space along with charred and frozen limbs and bodies. I destroyed back cells prison, along with every single person inside. Sterling's eyes finally turned from the destruction that was once back cells over to Dresden. What? But all of the other prisoners? There were a few dozen I deemed worthy of saving and transported them to a realm with no overseer for safety. Many of the others inside would have been significant threats to the multiverse and to their own worlds, so I allowed the destruction to take them as well. How many people did you just kill? There was a pause. Kate looked over to Alexis, who was the most opposed to killing out of anyone in their group. Her eyes had practically gone red, but she was holding back for the moment. Finally, Dresden said, Including the 16,317 overseers who leapt into the prison, there were roughly 204,000 people inside when the destruction took place. Another deafening pause. Kate knew she should be as livid as Alexis looked, but in that moment she found she was more concerned for Sterling, who was now visibly shaking. Finally, the silence was broken by the very unwelcome voice of Harold, saying, Alright, come on y'all, you can't be that surprised, right? I mean, I've heard most of y'all saying how you thought Silver here was being way overconfident about Drezzy making a face turn and becoming a- Sterling suddenly whipped around. Does this seem like the time for an I told you so Harold? He stopped himself, catching some of the reactions to the outburst. Kate had even felt herself skate one foot back at the response. She thought it was a totally justified response on Sterling's part, but she'd never seen him yell at anyone like that. It looked like others in the group felt the same. Sterling's expression shifted from furious to some blend of terrified and just 
broken. Alexis started to step forwards, but before she could say anything, Sterling spoke in a deadpan voice, walking away from the scene as he did. Benny, however many mech suits you have that can help the group breathe in space, get them and go looking for survivors. Astra, lock Dresden up in the basement and take his overseer abilities away. Kate? She usually liked hearing her name from him, but in that moment, it felt wrong. You're in charge of his punishment. Do whatever you think is right. As Sterling was leaving the foyer, he tried to say something to stop him, but Sterling just muttered, Not now, Heath. I, I need some time. And continued down the hall, away. The rest of that day was a strange, murky blur. Alexis had led Kayla, Heath, Mara, Champagne, and Benny, in the mech suits he'd brought, into Dresden's universe to look for survivors. But they found no signs of life. Astra had done as Sterling instructed and created an energy prison in the basement, and while doing so had learned from Dresden that every wall and floor of his planet-sized prison had been lined with explosives. Setting them all off was the equivalent to detonating tens, if not hundreds of thousands of nuclear warheads at once. Anyone that hadn't been killed by the explosions would have suffocated or frozen in the vacuum of space in the aftermath. Kate thought that she'd have to wait a few days before going to see Dresden, as using the multiversal orb shards to take Dresden's overseer abilities away would have been a time-consuming task. But Astra returned from the basement after less than half an hour, saying that Dresden had given up the powers willingly. She then stored them away in the multiversal orb for the time being, of which their group now had all four pieces stored safely away in their vault. And so, the time was here. Kate had an opportunity that she thought she'd wanted for so long. She was literally given full freedom to torture the man who'd taken her from her family at five years old and essentially locked her in hell for 20 years. But now, the idea of beating him senseless for days on end didn't really appeal to her. Especially since he'd given himself up willingly, knowing that torture was a likely possibility. If anything, she wanted to break him in the way he'd just seemed to have broken Sterling. Physically torturing him would have been a strain on her mental state as well, but maybe emotional torture could have been even worse for Dresden. Make sure he felt the real impact of what he'd just done. That thought was the first thing that distracted Kate enough from her concern for Sterling to actually do something. After some planning with Astra, she thought maybe she could even bring Sterling in on what she had in mind. Sterling wasn't usually vengeful, but Kate thought that maybe bringing him along to watch Dresden get emotionally broken back would make Sterling feel better. Kate slept on it, or tried to, hoping Sterling would finally emerge from his room in the morning. But he was still nowhere to be seen when she awoke. Everyone's routine was completely shaken, but by noon the next day she still hadn't seen him and decided to just go to his room. She was anxious to knock at first, but was confident she had a good proposal for him, so she followed through. It took a few sets of knocks before he finally slid open the metal door. He looked exhausted with large bags under his eyes, but still faked a faint smile, briefly. Hey, Kate, I, I'm really sorry, but whatever this is, can, can it just wait? I, I need some more time alone. She pushed through with her pitch anyway. I think I've got something planned for Dresden that might make you feel better, though. Astra knew some of the overseers that were killed, and even though she hates most overseers too, she knew that a few of them were actually doing good stuff in their worlds. On top of that, she knows they had families, so we're going to take Dresden to them and make him tell them what he did and why, so that he has to face the fact that he just killed family members of perfectly good people. Kate, you can't... He cut her off aggressively, but then paused. I... I, I get the idea, but that's also going to be torturing the families that just lost people by making them face the man that killed their relatives too quickly. I'm sorry, but that's just a cruel thing to do to them. Kate suddenly felt her heart thumping nervously. Sterling's usual gentle tone was clearly blunted. Oh, okay, I'll come up with something else like that, though, and I thought you could come with us so that you can see him Kate, when- please, just, I really want to be left alone. Right, but maybe this'll help you feel better- Kate, seriously, just go- like earlier when he'd snapped at Harold, his face shifted from anger to horror. Kate glanced down and realized that she'd instinctively raised her fists at his response. She quickly dropped them, but before she could say anything, he said, I'm... Uh, I, I'm sorry, but this is why I just really need to be left alone right now. He started tapping his multiverse jumping wristwatch as he slid the door closed. 
I'm, I'm gonna go somewhere to breathe. I'll, I'll talk to you later. She heard him teleport away and was frozen in fear from the encounter for a moment. Then she slammed her fist right into the wall in anger. Suddenly, she really did want to hit someone. She marched towards the basement to finally go see Dresden. Kate stomped into the basement with her teeth clenched tightly and her fists even more so. She came into the dimly lit underground to see the only thing left in the space, aside from an old dusty desk and a few chairs, was Dresden, sitting slumped over in the middle of a wide ring of pale green light. When he saw her approaching, he raised his head and slowly stood up. I imagine you're here for the first of many torture sessions, Caitlin. Though I will advise you, as strong as you are, you may require something more substantial than fists to damage my magma-crusted flesh. I may have relinquished my overseer abilities, but my other abilities still remain. Kate didn't respond. There was still fury pumping through her, but she took a breath before taking any action. She'd learned enough about her own responses to things over the last year to feel that it was really just her frustration at the encounter with Sterling causing her current anger. She knew she was justified in hating Dresden, but in that moment, with his own sunken expression and quiet voice, he almost already felt as broken as Sterling was. She somewhat pitied him. She finally said, You watched me through a lot of my time in your stupid prison, right? I had many other priorities, but yes, I did keep a regular watch on your growth and actions. So you probably think that you know me. Yes, I'd say as much as it may frustrate you to hear, I believe I know you better than- No, you don't, she snarled. You may have known the version of me that left back cells. I was unkillable and a fighter that could take on anyone, no matter what kind of powers they had over me. But I came out of there like a savage and pathetic feral animal. And maybe that is who you deserve to have torture you, but that's not me anymore. These people have helped me become so much better than the person you forced me to become by locking me away in back cells. Kate suddenly realized that her fists had unclenched. She stood upright and crossed her arms. So, no, you don't know me, but I guess I also don't really know you either. I only found out you were the one that locked me up on the day I escaped, so I've made a lot of guesses about who you are and why you do all the horrible stuff that you do, but now I want to hear it from you. Hear what, exactly? Kate shrugged. I don't know, why'd you kill the overseers? Why'd you turn yourself in? Why are you... you? Then, to both Dresden and Kate's surprise, Kate sat in silence for a few hours and just listened as Dresden told her, essentially, his whole life story from his own perspective. Who he was before becoming an overseer, how his hatred for other overseers had started and grown, his relationship to the demon queen Fear herself, and how that had recently started falling apart, prompting him to go behind her back and enact the plan that they'd made together, early, without her, to kill the overseers. He'd once thought that he'd have to wait for the being known as the Reaper to be killed before enacting this plan, or else she'd promptly kill him for threatening the fabric of the multiverse but it seemed that threat was not as he'd assumed. In his own words, I believed that as soon as I enacted my plan, I'd be faced with death at the scythe of the Reaper. But I followed through anyhow, and even still, she is nowhere to be seen. Perhaps overseers are not as important to the multiverse as many would believe. When she did not arrive, I came here, deeming that... Whatever was meant of my fate, you deserved a chance to get whatever revenge upon me you sought." As he neared the end of his final story, Kate certainly still didn't like Dresden, but she could actually see him as a human being now. An awful one, yes, but not the mythical monster that had resided in her mind for so long. But as he started to move into what seemed like an apology to her for locking her away all those years ago, she realized that she wasn't ready to hear that yet, and marched out of the basement without another word. She didn't know how to feel about what she'd just done. 
She had gone down there wanting to beat him senseless, but other, newer instincts had taken over. Part of her felt cowardly, as if she'd just chickened out, but another part felt like she'd just made a more mature decision. It was the kind of situation she'd usually talk to Sterling about to try and process it, but realizing that just reminded her of their last conversation, and the angry and fearful thoughts started trickling back in. As she marched through the building, she passed by the dining room to see that most of their group was in there, sitting in near silence. She stopped and looked at them, and they all looked back at her. Alexis eyed Kate's hands, likely looking for signs of blood. She then asked, Did you just see Dresden? Kate walked into the room. Yeah, but I didn't kill him or anything, if that's what you're wondering. I didn't even touch him. Has anyone seen Sterling yet? Heath paced around at the back of the room. I went by his room an hour ago. It doesn't sound like he's even here anymore. Taryn, with his arm around Kayla's shoulder, said, I believe it's possible he's gone to my world. I felt someone transport into my realm a few hours ago, and Sterling is well aware that I had a cabin built near the nexus point of my world, for whenever some of our party needs to spend the night there. If he was looking to be alone, that may be a logical place to go. Though... Alexis has informed us that it may be best to leave him be for now. Kate looked back at Alexis. She and Sterling had known each other for longer than anyone else in the group, and while Kate felt like she had grown very close to Sterling over the last year, she also knew that Alexis was practically his sister, and likely had more experience with this kind of situation. Alexis said, Sterling doesn't get like this a lot, and hasn't in a long time, but when he does have a breakdown like this, as much as it sucks, he really just wants to be left alone to process things on his own. Benny, leaned up against Dr. Champagne, said, I mean, we just want to help the guy. I guess he's smart enough to know how he deals with stuff like this, but it just kind of feels wrong to leave him alone. Alexis sighed. I know, but we should just let him do his thing. He'll come around soon enough. Kate looked around at everyone. They were in the middle of a huge mess, but it seemed like the thing on everyone's mind was that they just wanted to help and support their friend, and they didn't feel like they could. Anger started bubbling up in Kate again, but it was different this time. It felt more useful. She activated her multiverse jumping wristwatch, and as she did, Alexis said, Kate, seriously, just leave him alone. Alexis, don't, Kate interrupted. I know what I'm doing. Though, in her head, she finished that sentence with, I think. She vanished in a blink of light with the whole group hoping she was right. Kate appeared in Taryn's dimension and headed towards where she was pretty sure Taryn had built the cabin. It took her a bit of time to find, but there were recent footprints around Sterling's size headed to the door. She marched up to it and knocked. Sterling, are you in there? There was a brief pause, but then she heard from inside. Kate, are you... St please, just go away. No, I'm not leaving you alone right now. There was silence again. She didn't hear him getting up to come to the door, so she tried to open it herself. But it was locked. Kate, I, I'm not kidding, please, I just need time. But then, Kate stepped back, swung up her leg, and booted the door in, cracking the wooden lock to splinters. She stepped into the room as Sterling leapt up from one of the five beds inside. Kate, are you crazy? Why won't you just leave me alone? Because you wouldn't leave me alone if I was like this. I, th I, I think you're just being a coward, Sterling. And I know you'd probably have a way nicer way to say this, but I have to say it my way. Do you think it's been fun for me all the times you've seen me broken and angry and scared? All of the times I've let you help me through the mess that my mind was after getting out of back cells? Because it wasn't, not at all. I hated letting anyone see me like that, but I knew that you could help and that you wanted to help and that I needed your help. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it after the fact, but now that you're the one who's broken, instead of letting me and all of your amazing friends help you, I think you're just hiding away because you don't want us to see you like this. To know that even our smiley, supportive, and always happy friend can be broken sometimes too. But you don't get to just hide away in a hole and leave all of your friends to worry about when you're going to be okay again. It's not right. Kate panted as if she'd just run a marathon. And 
Sterling just looked away from her and stared at the wall. Kate, I... I can't always stop myself from snapping at people and getting mad at people when I'm like this, and I can't stand how people look at me when I'm out of control. He was shaking again, but Kate continued. Well, tough luck, Sterling. Everyone in this group has had times where we've been out of control, and it hasn't ruined any of our friendships. So whether you like it or not, I'm staying here with you till you're ready to come home, no matter how many times you snap at me or freak out at me or tell me to leave. You don't get a say in whether or not I'm helping you anymore. I'm here, and I'm going to help. Kate stepped closer to him, but realized that she was shaking too. He finally glanced up to her eyes, and his were glazed over and on the brink of tears. She continued, I don't... I'm not you. I'm not used to helping people through stuff like this. I don't know the right stuff to say, so you just have to tell me. How can I help you? What would be the most supportive and, and comforting thing I can do for you right now? At the question, his eyes suddenly darted away again, and his face went into a full beet red blush. I... I, I, I don't... I don't know, Kate. Instinctively, she stepped closer and put a hand on his heart. She'd never done that before, but it just felt sort of right, and she quickly noticed that his heart was pounding like a jackhammer. Sterling, come on, just tell me how to help, whatever it is. He was still clearly hesitant and having a hard time holding eye contact, but finally said, I mean, it, it's not fair of me to ask you, but it, it would be really comforting to just hold you. Suddenly, her heart was pounding even harder than his. Brief hugs were one thing, but she didn't know if something longer would be too much. But even still, she gently pushed Sterling back down onto the bed, and he lay on his side. She lay down in front of him facing away, nervously grabbed his arm and pulled it over her, around her waist. Their positions settled and all went quiet, save for the thumping of both their hearts, which eventually became in sync and slowed. Kate had been worried in the first few moments that this would be almost like torture to her, but eventually found that while this was meant to help Sterling, she was sinking into a relaxation unlike anything she'd ever felt. His body against hers, with his arm around her, felt like a cocoon of protection that nothing in the world could pierce. Eventually, she quietly said, Is... Uh, is this helping? She only realized when he responded that he was crying. <laughs> yeah, it, it is honestly more than I can even really explain. Thanks, Kate. Kate wasn't sure how long they stayed like that. She was so comfortable that eventually she fell asleep. When she woke up, there was a warm orange light painted across her face from the setting sun. Her hand was resting on Sterling's, still wrapped around her, and with him still there, she realized she was more calm than she'd ever been upon waking up. She angled her head back to see if he was awake. He was, and he slid back slightly so that she could turn further, and while she saw his clearly tear-stained cheeks, he did finally have back his usual smile. She asked, H How do you feel? He nodded. A lot better. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I still feel like I just let thousands and thousands of people die because I was too sure that Dresden was changing his mind. But besides that, I, I do know that you were right about me. I was just scared of our friends and, I guess, most of all, you seeing me like that. But, I, I mean, how do you feel? This is probably the most physical contact you've made with anyone in a long time. Did, do you, did you feel okay? She could feel that she was blushing again, but just accepted it at this point. I honestly think I want to do this more. Maybe a lot more. Sterling's face joined her in red hue, but Kate continued. But I know we should probably go because the others really want to see you and help you too. I mean, ho hopefully not help you in, you know, the same way as me, but... Sterling nodded. No, yeah, of course, I'll only... Th this is something that I only really want to do with the you. Kate nodded rapidly. Good, I mean, yeah, no, yep, that's... She trailed off of whatever she was trying to say as she stood up, and instantly felt like she wanted to lay back down next to him again, but knew that they should be getting back. 
She updated Sterling on some of the things Dresden had told her, and enjoyed his pleased response at what she'd done instead of pummeling Dresden. They both then transported back to the nexus point of Dimension A016, and headed back into the Sharp Tank. Sterling got on the PA for the building and called for a group meeting in the dining room. Most of them were already in there, but those who weren't rushed over upon hearing Sterling's voice. He apologized to them all and admitted to basically exactly what Kate had said, but of course they were all just happy that he was finally letting them help, and they assured him that none of them blamed him for what Dresden had done. They had all genuinely hoped that he was right, and some of them had been convinced that he was. Kate stood to the side for a while as she'd had her own time with Sterling, and seeing him be helped by all of his friends gave Kate an unusual surge of pride. The fact that she had actually been right about Sterling needing help made her feel like she truly was a totally transformed person from who she'd been for basically her entire life. She really felt that all the terrible things Dresden had put her through really no longer had a say in how she acted. Of course, once more hugging and crying was done through the group, Sterling spoke to them all about what they should do with Dresden. Many ideas were thrown around, and they did finally settle on a proposition Sterling gave that Alexis did heartily back, despite not loving some aspects of it. Once more, they all slept on it, and then they all gathered once more in the morning to finalize the decision. Then, Sterling went down to talk to Dresden alone, though Kate stood near the top of the stairs and listened in on the conversation, along with another member of the group. One of the first things that Dresden said was, I'd like to apologize, Mr. Angeal, for the likely alarming realization that you were so wrong about me. To which Sterling responded, You just killed 200,000 people on a decision that you weren't even certain was the right thing to do, Dresden. That does make you a lot more immature and cruel than I thought you were, but you haven't proven that I was wrong about you. I still think there's a good person in you, and maybe I am wrong, but we're still going to take the time to find out. Kate couldn't tell for sure, but she assumed that just then Sterling had brought down the shield around Dresden, stepped forward, and put a device onto his arm. This here is a reworked version of our multiverse jumping wristwatches. It can also suppress the powers that you still have if we need it to, courtesy of our friend Benny. But most importantly, it's linked to a member of our group who can shut off your powers, give you a shock, or even teleport you right beside her anytime she wants. I... Don't understand. What form of punishment is this? Well, as grim as it may sound, I'm pretty sure you were hoping to die after you killed all the Overseers. You thought the Reaper would do it, then maybe you thought Kate would do it if you came here, and you really didn't want to hang around to see if what you'd done really was the right thing or not. Well, now you're gonna have to. You're going to help us clean up all the messes that you just caused in different dimensions, and basically spend the rest of your natural life helping us make the multiverse a genuinely better place, by helping good people do more good, and not by killing people that you consider bad. I... see, and by your phrasing I assume you are not the one I'll be answering to? No way, we've all agreed that, as much as I think I might still be right about you being a good person somewhere down in there, I clearly cannot be trusted to make decisions about you and your sentence here. As he said that, the person beside Kate started marching down the stairs, and Kate walked down a bit closer as well to see what was happening. Sterling continued, Dresden Oakland, meet your new warden, Alexis Jones. She is our group's noble leader and has a pretty big beef with anyone who kills people. So if you step out of line, we can definitely all trust her to wrangle you back in and not go easy on you like I probably would. Plus, I've got a little theory about her mineral magnetism powers and you. Alexis raised her hand and clenched her fist, activating her ability. Dresden, with his magma-crusted flesh, suddenly slid across the floor right towards her and his chest stuck to her forearm. Sterling nodded. That was pretty cool, I guess I was right. Alexis pulled his face closer to hers. I'm going to make sure that you live long enough to repent for every single life that you took. She then reversed her power and he flew back from her, slamming against the distant wall. Sterling then called across the basement. I'll let you process all this and then show you to your room a little bit later. Which Alexis will keep the key for, by the way. But hey, welcome to the Sharp Gang, Dresden. Sterling walked back up the stairs and Kate instinctively opened her arms to give him a hug. They both happily embraced and Sterling chuckled as they did. I knew that somehow, this was still going to be an amazing week.
I know a lot of stuff happened in this episode that's pretty exciting for Multiverse Tales fans, but honestly one of my favorite things is the fact that now Dresden Oakland can be involved in banter episodes. Him having a chat with Benny is going to be an interesting thing to hear. I'm also very excited to do a Design Notes podcast episode about this story, where I talk about things that I considered writing into it, things that might have got cut, why I wrote it the way I did, how long I've been planning it. Like my other weekly podcast, that'll be up on the Popcross Studios Patreon on Wednesday. And I'm very excited for this to lead into the next two Multiverse Tales episodes, which are both coming out at the end of October and will be the community redraw for September and October. Thanks for all the submissions so far. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote from a woman named Leila Hormazi, who gives a nice and simple one, some days you feel great, some days you feel awful. Stick to the plan, either way. There are plenty of days where I wake up and I'm not really feeling like doing my work, even though I have a job that I love. But I know that I gotta just press forward and also know that usually once I get started, a little ways in, I'll start enjoying myself. I hope that's inspiring, I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode on Friday. Goodbye.